Hi, I'm Sean Holly. Welcome to the Rugby Hive. Shumai, Sean Holly, are we? Croiso e Rugby Hive. We had somebody like Jerry Collins, God rest his soul. You know, Jerry was renowned as a hard man, he was around as a big drinker as well, okay? So you, everyone knows me in this area, so I get like phone calls on a Sunday. He'd have a map of our area on his on his flat wall, and he'd pinprick on a, on a Sunday, and where it was, he'd just go, he'd go to that club. Um, so I'd have phone calls on a Sunday, things like, you know, uh, Sean, all right, it's uh, Glyn Heath Rugby Club here. Just letting you know, Jerry's here, having a couple of pints, playing the bandit. All right, he's all right, he's all right. Then a couple of hours later, I have another one then. Sean, come grah, Rugby Club here. Just letting you know, Jerry's here. He's having a couple of pints of cider. He's playing bingo with the members. He's all right, he's fine. <laughs> and then my brother come up then. He said, I just saw Jerry in, in the shop in, uh, in town. I said, really? Yeah, he's walking out with a, a 40-inch colour TV. I'm thinking, where's he going now? And then the last phone call of the night then. Sean, oh, Abraham and Quinn's here. Just letting you know, Jerry's here. He's putting up our new TV for us. He's having a great... <laughs> he's so dangerous, Freddy Krueger has nightmares about him. Hello and welcome to the Rugby Hive. I'm Dan and Stanford, and despite my South African accent, I was fortunate enough to play rugby for the United States on the Sevens World Series. And I'm Robin McDowell, a former Canadian Sevens international. Back in my playing days, I went head-to-head against Dallin in the USA. For several years, Robin has coached international Sevens for various countries, including Canada and Mexico. He's massively passionate about growing the game across the Americas through his McDowell rugby programs at all levels. I'm currently a commentator for World Rugby, most recently broadcasting the Rugby World Cup in Japan, as well as the amazing Sevens World Series. More than a decade later, we are teaming up to bring you insights from legendary players and coaches from around the world. All legends have a story. The Rugby Hive podcast is here to share it. Welcome to the Hive. Oh, it's more dangerous than climate change. Hello and welcome to Season 2, Episode 28 of the Rugby Hive podcast, brought to you by Wintergreen, who produce a brilliant range of products containing wintergreen oil and other therapeutic natural activities that help athletes before, during, and after training. Visit the sleek sensations at wintergreensport.com. They're a proud partner of USA Rugby and Major League Rugby, as well as the Hive. Well, champions, listen, the last few months have absolutely flown by. It has been amazing to be back on the plane, call rugby tournaments locally and internationally. Plus, we've had two different Rugby Hive gatherings get together in person, if you will. One at the Canada HSBC World Rugby Sevens in Vancouver and the other in Memphis, Tennessee for the All World Premier Sevens. Uh, let's start with Vancouver, a brilliant city, BC place, an absolutely magic venue. Uh, Rob's finally got to see you in person since all this madness started with the pandemic, as well as the Gaz Barino. The Gaz was in town from Vancouver. Her and her son James flew out and got a train with our academy on Vancouver Island in the lead up to the Vancouver Sevens. But yeah, it was great to get everybody together. Had a good end of the week uh, um, catch up couple jars as you say um, but overall it was just so great to uh, see that vibe back at BC Place see the athletes on the field all the fresh faces um, of course there were some yeah, legends on the field but it was also nice to see a new generation of Canadians Americans and other athletes from around the world in action again on the global stage and also see some butts in the seats uh, watching sports again was exciting. Yeah, and I was really impressed with, you know, the younger players, as you mentioned, coming through. There were some, some real brilliant performances. Uh, Demi McGraw, who was on our previous episode, his team Germany did superbly, even taken out USA there. Canada came back to death uh, with a kick from the side. Brennan Prevost, there, was, there were so many magical moments uh, from, from a lot of different teams. And, and the sides, as you mentioned, too, that we don't often see on the World Series. Mexico, who you've coached uh, their women's side, they were the represented there. Jamaica as well. So it was really, really great, you know. And then speaking of game-changing activities and events, the Premier Sevens, uh, talk about your role, who you work with, all that sort of good stuff, because it was so good to see your face there at the, at the champion rounds. Yeah, I think, uh, like yourself, I've been been fortunate enough to be involved with the world series or professional sports, both as an athlete and player for 20 years or so. God, that makes me old, but uh, I got to say it was one of my favorite weeks uh, in sports in my life. And uh, obviously sports and specifically sevens have consumed most of my life. Uh, You know, always as, as a player and a coach at that level, number one, I'm always a fan and just happy to see opportunities. So uh, Owen Scano, the CEO, and uh, of course, the legendary uh, coach, Mike Tolkien, who's the GM of the Premier Sevens, 
uh, reached out about getting some American athletes involved, sorry, some Canadian athletes alongside the Americans uh, this year. So I put together some men and women and uh, I just thrilled for North Americans in general to, uh, to have an opportunity uh, to, you know, as a stepping stone to get into team USA or team Canada, but also for those that, are already playing for Team USA or Team Canada, men and women, to to get a chance to play with other Canadians or other athletes. So it's uh, it, it was one of the most positive weeks on and off the field. And then again, just you know, uh, I don't know. I think I I think I must have had about three hundred cups of coffee at some of the local brew shops in town, catching up with the American coaches. Uh, you know, Kate Daly, uh, Bidewell. Uh, list goes on, but of course, uh, one of my best friends uh, in the States is uh, Colton Carriaga uh, from Life University. So uh, yeah, it was overall super positive. And then, you know, it was really exciting for me as a Canadian coach is getting to work with some of the top Eagles uh, women's players, uh, which are obviously some of the top players in the world. And uh, I was fortunate to work with the Loonies. I, I said to Mike uh, that I, I had to work with the Loonies because it was the team of the North. And obviously I live in the North country and there's loons in my front door. And uh, I begged to have a lab. Uh, I wanted the quarterback. I wanted the kicker. I wanted the the general and, and I got her and she certainly delivered. And, and, you know, um, it was great having her on the pod last year and, and hearing about her, uh, her background and upbringing. And then uh, another player that I, I really loved to work with was, was uh, Nana Faezi. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but uh, yeah, like you're, I just, you're not, I'm not go ahead and say it for me. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Nana Faezi. You're right. But what an inspirational Faezi, leader she is. Yeah. Carry on. She's brilliant. Yeah. So, I mean, she, um, she was super chill during the week. She knows how to look after her body. And then when it came to game day, like watch out, obviously four games in one day, we, uh, and then all the young players, supporting players around them did their jobs. And uh, I got to work alongside legendary USA captain and the first captain for the Eagles in 2016 at the Olympics is Kelly Griffin. And, and Griff was, uh, was the yin and my yang. And that obviously I'm wild and crazy like Dallin and she's super calm, cool, collected. And yeah, hopefully we get to continue our partnership together. And uh, I threw a certain bet down or, uh, or expectation down for the team. If we win this thing, uh, we were the underducks, as uh, as uh, the ladies were saying, that I would get a tattoo. So now I have, uh, thanks to Dallin, I have the whole world uh, uh, waiting for me to get some my first my first bit of ink on my skin. So that's it. That's in uh, in uh, in conversation with my wife right now. But so far, I think I'm 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 closer to getting it. Let's let's put it that way. Well, Robert, let's let's first go here. Your mom tuned into the broadcast, <laughs> isn't that so? And the first thing she heard is me teeing up, saying, "Well, the coaches have said." Robin and Kelly have said if they win this game, they win the championship, they will get a Looney's tattoo, the logo, uh, in their first ever season, the inaugural tournament. And you got, you came from behind, you did it. It was amazing because you lost in the pool to that same team. And so that victory was, was so sweet. But mainly, everybody was cheering for the tattoos. Uh, absolutely. I actually got a, I actually got a notification on my, uh, my Apple watch in the middle of the game. I don't keep my phone on me, obviously at the game, but I guess my, my phone was close enough to my watch. that I got a message from my mom. I, I sh- in the middle of the game, I sure hope you win, but you better not get a tattoo was, was exactly what happened. So I was, I was pissing myself laughing at, at that one, but, uh, but yeah, no, I, uh, Carrie, we got to get Carrie Agro on here one time to just, to, to let you know, I'm not BSing you, but I, we won the first game against the loggerheads and I was sitting in the stands with him watching, watching uh, some of the men's games. And I looked over and I said, we'll win the next game. We'll lose uh, against the headliners in the third game, which is our final pool game. Essentially didn't mean nothing. And, uh, and we'll win the final. And I, I walked over, he walked over to me after his final and he said, you called it. I said, yeah, absolutely. So uh, we worked our subs well. And uh, it was, it was a real thrill to, to, uh, to be a, a part of the first ever women's professional uh, league in, in North America. And also uh, obviously, you know, being thankful to that the girls got it done. So really happy and proud of them. Yeah, Robs, I can back that up because I had a little beverage with your cowboy friend, Colton Carriaga, obviously in yourself afterwards. And he confirmed that fact, which, which is fantastic, you know, but you're so right. I want to touch on the fact that this is amazing for the future players, uh, Canadian players and American players. Delaney uh, uh, Aikens was fantastic uh, MVP in for the woman as, uh, on that side. And, um, and Logan Targo for the men, two players that I didn't know on my personal radar covering the seven, seven series. And these are young up and coming stars, which is great. And the fact that the players get paid equally, both the men and women is really brilliant. It's on a national broadcast. It was on Fox TV. It was on TSN. 
um, and is available obviously online as well for folks. So really, really cool to catch the other national selectors. And I know the men's side, Mike Friday was texting me during the tournament saying, hey, who's this player? Who's this? Find more information on this one. And that he was at least watching them, which is so great to see, you know? So raising the profile, creating euros for also the next generation of young boys and girls that are watching on TV or happen to be in Memphis or wherever the next tournaments are. So we can't wait to see what's planned for 2022. And there should be a few tournaments back to back, which would be really cool because, you know, then it'll be like the World 7 Series, but domestic in, in North America will be so great. Yeah, on the on the selection side, two two uh, Canadian men have been uh, carded now and, and offered contracts with Canadian men sevens on the back of that. One was Noah Bain. Uh, Noah's been uh, he was in my my essentially my team Canada University side in 2019. He's played for a couple in my team in a couple of Mac Dual rugby tournaments, or sorry, Mac Dual teams in some elite tournaments. And then of course the Canadian Rocket, who you've come to know, uh, he's tore up the USA this year. And and thanks to the USA in, in Utah, Rugby Town Sevens, and now the Premier Sevens, he's now on his way to the US uh, next week with the Canadian Men's Sevens team to have some hit ups against Friday's Dog. So um, without the PR Sevens, without Rugby Town Sevens, Luke would still be on the farm in Saskatchewan. So it's life changing for him. Yeah, he's such a great player, Lucas Sheck. Uh, the Canadian Rocket. Let's get to other partners. We want to thank World Rugby Shop. We have over 45 amazing items there in our merch store, uh, different items for different occasions, whether it's winter, summer, or we just want to you know, get some Christmas gifts for the family and friends. Go to worldrugbyshop.com and type in Rugby Hive. We also want to thank Gilbert Rugby Canada, who now have our Rugby Hive ball manufactured and ready to ship in Canada. That same ball is also available on World Rugby Shop if you need to get it in the USA or beyond. Uh, we've just put up some socials about that, so that's really exciting to see. Then another partnership I want to shout out, uh, we just formed with the legends at Enduro Sports. Every single member of their team, the avid outdoorsmen, passionate sports people that are into health, fitness, and nutrition, their collective goal as an organization has been the same since they started, uh, which is get more people outside by improving their mental and physical health with uh, premium performance boosting supplements. So I know, Robin, you've tried it. I know Verity is a huge fan in my household. I've had it as well, Enduro Sport pre-action, get your body ready for any activity you want to do, whether it's obviously a workout or just a hike or, you know, or just, just running around goose-stepping people like park cars. Uh, one thing I want to say about their product too is, which is really cool and important, is the ingredients. They NSF certified for sport, and that means there's no banned substances. It's clean and it's brilliant, uh, and it's and it's good for you as well, which is so great. You know, so absolutely love that. They, I know they're offering forty percent off on Enduro Sport because you guys are listening to the Rugby Hive. So go to go to the website endurosportofficial.com. We'll put the link up though how you get your forty percent off, and just uh, obviously keep following the Rugby Hive socials for that. You know, so. Without further ado, though, let's switch across and mention our previous episodes. If you're a new listener and you're just tuning in, welcome, you absolute sensations. Brilliant to have you. This season, we featured Cecil Africa, the Blitzbok and South African playmaker extraordinaire, John and Dave Moonlight, the two Canadian fire trucks on the field, and Debbie McGraw, who is the longtime sevens coach and now with Germany. So they're all, all brilliant guests. Make sure you click on those and, and check out those a little later. All right, switching gears, Rob, let's catch up. What's been going on? It's been a hectic few months. Travel has been on the on the docket. What have you been up to? Give us some updates on your side. Well, when we started the Hive over a year ago, uh, obviously we were in full lockdown in both countries and uh, and building and building and building like we do. And uh, both of us are obviously hot on the trail. So uh, my academy, MacDool Rugby uh, Island Academy on Vancouver Island, we have uh, 30, 36, 37 athletes now, uh, full-time training three hours a day within uh, a local s- school here. It's it's the New Zealand of the North as far as uh, where we live and, and the climate, uh, just as much rain, just as much sun and uh, not, not as much snow. So uh, it's been, it's been beautiful. That, that was one of my COVID projects and now it's li- alive and, and thriving. And uh, we're looking to grow it, double it next year um, to have an afternoon group. So these kids five days a week get three hours of either S and C, mindfulness with our, our sports psychology coach, nutrition, nutrition, working with nutritionists that work with the team Canada Olympic groups, uh, and then obviously rugby skills with, uh, with me. So it's, it's been absolutely sensational. we got athletes from across Canada, across the U S um, across the UK involved in our program. And uh, just seeing them come together is, is very, very special and getting to do what I love every day is, is really the best part. So really thankful for that. And then, um, yeah, outside of uh, checking out the World Series in Vancouver and obviously uh, traveling to Memphis out of country, uh, I got lots on the go. Uh, November, I think I'm only in Canada for four days this upcoming month. So I just got my latest uh, uh, COVID uh, nose tickler and, uh, and then off I go on Monday. How about on your side? 
Oh, that's brilliant, Rob. So can't, can't wait to catch up, but we'll, we'll get back to that in a second. Yeah, I, I want to give Rugby Canada a shout-out, actually. I forgot to do that earlier in the pod. They were brilliant hosting us in Vancouver and Edmonton for the Sevens. To be able to put on you know, a world-class event like they have was, was really fantastic. All hands on deck there, so I want to thank them. And The Edmonton Stadium was really cool, home of the Edmonton Elks. I had family that live up there as well, so it was really cool to catch up with them. And also Magic just being back in the booth after 18 months uh, commentating. Yeah, it's been busy, pal. Comment- commentating, I uh, did uh, quite a few games with... Uh, Olympian and USA men's sevens captain Madison Hughes. We did some of the USA Rugby World Cup qualifiers. I don't know if it's good, if we're just a good luck charm because the games we did, the USA won. Uh, but as soon as they left the US shores, things uh, went pear shaped. So we did games against Canada and Uruguay. Uh, and then the real dream to be able to call the All Blacks. Uh, and even though it was Freddy Krueger scary, in fact, uh, I know Wes Craven couldn't have directed that 104 points to 14. But at the same time, New Zealand is the best attacking team in the world. They're able to exploit gaps and they play what's in front of them. A really talented squad. It was really a dream to call that. We had 40,000 fans in Washington, D.C. at FedEx Field. Uh, and was really, really fabulous to be able to call, you know, some of the best players in the world. And, and I want to obviously say something, you know, like the U.S. is ranked 17 in the world. And like Canada, it, it's very tough to compete with the top sides in the world. I think if the Springboks had played the USA, it probably would have been a 60-point game. But the fact that New Zealand are able to spread the ball around like butter is, is, is really tough, you know. Saying that, I think the objective was met because the US put a bid in to host the Rugby World Cup on the men's side, either 2027 or 2031, and the Women's World Cup in 2029. So the fact that we're able to get you know fans out to support rugby is huge. Beautiful stadiums, the, the organization is there. Uh, it, it is exciting times. Obviously, some folks have hopped a bit too much on the results. The results will come. MLR... Premier Sevens, things like that are growing the game uh, and, you know, give it another 10 years and we'll, we'll see where things are. I think the future is pretty exciting, you know. Uh, and then just a couple other quick things. They already packed our bags and off we went to Turks and Caicos for the Rugby America's North Sevens tournament. That was certainly one of the, my personal highlights of my commentating career. Being able to go to a, such a beautiful island to, you know, have accommodation on the beach, uh, call some brilliant teams in action uh, was, was really great. Mixing business with pleasure. We had nine countries represented there. That fantastic tournament. Belize played in their very first ever event. They scored their first ever try. They were so great because even after the tournament ended the next day, they came back to the field. They helped pack up. They helped take down the tents. Really true sportsmanship and, and was so eager and they were, they were so great, you know. So a shout out to them. Jamaica was so cool to see them back in action and Mexico as well. They competed in the final. Jamaica just won and uh, they qualify for the 2022 World Rugby Challenger Series for, for next season. Uh, but it was so great to be, to be there and, and, and work with those countries. I know, Robs, you said you're going to join me next time at one of those events. Yeah, I'll either be coaching one of those countries, or I'll just be yeah. uh, I'll just be your fishing guide and translator. So, well, exactly, technical advisor to every single country there, which means you have to stop off, you know, at the different times of the year and and have a vacation there. Because Salty Thompson was there in Turks and Caicos. I was like, "What are you doing there?" He goes, "I'm just enjoying time at the beach." Oh yes, and I'm working with a rugby team. <laughs> well, I'm not going to let you big dog me too much. So I'm headed to the Caribbean on Monday. I didn't want you to to big dog me, but uh, yeah, I get to go to Trinidad and Tobago. It's been in talks for three years or so since I wrapped up with Mexico. I had a number of Caribbean countries reach out to me within the Rugby America's North uh, group. And uh, to be honest, Trinidad's the country, one of the countries I've always wanted to work with, you know, the other ones being kind of Fiji and Samoa in, in that they have, they, th- those athletes possess so much power. I, I love everything about their culture and uh, you know, Trinidad women were on the receiving end of, uh, of our, our 28, 2017, uh, world cup qualifier for 2018. We beat the women five, nothing. I tell you what, with, uh, with a little bit of coaching and a little different game plan, they, you know, the score probably would have been a lot different with, with a level of power. So I'm really excited to get on the ground and, 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 uh, speaking of Colton Carriaga, I'm actually taking my American BFF, uh, South with me too. So we got this Canada USA kind of combo to help, uh, uh, help uh, work with coaches, work with youth, and and work with national teams as we get on the ground in uh, Port of Spain in a few days here. Oh, that's so great! And then listen, pal, we're going to meet up soon as well. We've got the Dubai Sevens kicking off for the the start of the twenty twenty two HSBC World Rugby Seven Series. November twenty five and twenty six is the first event without fans, and then December three and four is stop number two in the desert with fans. It should be packed. It should be amazing. I'll be in the booth for those two. You are going to be with Frank the Tank, Frankie Horn. Tell us more. Yeah, so uh, I was I was actually supposed to work with uh, Frankie like right now, I guess, or or September and early October with uh, with the old ten series. But there's a new tens rugby championship starting, and it's kicking off in Lisbon, Portugal. So for me, it's location, location, location. I'm the head coach of the Cape Town Wild Dogs. I've never even been to Cape Town, but I'm in charge of the Wild Dogs women's side. 
uh, which is really, really exciting. Uh, I've helped select uh, men and women from across the world. Uh, the group has been so professional, so organized. So, you know, uh, Premier Seven's got a real North American feel, and this one has a really global feel. And uh, so I'll be with them. Uh, the missus and I, four days after Trinidad, we go straight to Portugal for our, our uh, belated uh, honeymoon. And then that'll tee right into uh, the Rugby Tens Championship in Portugal. And then I'll fly direct with Frankie and the group uh, to Dubai to coach in an elite men's international side with the likes of Zinjira and another uh, legendary uh, Kenyans and South African men. And uh, it'll be a huge honor to work with those guys uh, at that level, but also finally uh, get on the field uh, on the same side as Frankie uh, to, to partner with, a, again, a South African, now Canadian uh, combo. So just moving and shaking and, and learning and growing and, and just really thankful that uh, that I have a lot of opportunities to to work with people from across the world and uh, and do what we love in warm places. Yeah, well, now I've got to take you to my hometown, Cape Town. Next time we have a, a little break, maybe the Sevens World Cup, we'll, we'll hook that up. We'll get it going, my friend. Uh, it's going to be absolutely brilliant, you know. So let's switch across to episode 28 with the Welshman, Sean Holly. I first met Sean at the World Rugby Under-20 Championship, which took place in Rosario in Argentina in 2019. He had been stitches off the field, having a couple of jars, great energy, just a great man. Uh, he's just so humble. And uh, the Welsh have a great way of expressing themselves. And uh, he's certainly one of those. And it was, it's so great to see him back in the booth on our various TV shows as well. I know his country take on the All Blacks this weekend, uh, but Sean, it, it, it's a great episode, don't you think? Well, I, I hate to say it. I always say... Uh... This is my favorite episode, but I think he's, this is for sure one of my favorite episodes. I'd never met Sean. I'd heard of him obviously as a, as a class coach overseas uh, in Wales, but you know what? Um, Yeah, he's, he's, he's a lot of fun to listen to. He's very charismatic. Uh, He's got a lot of experiences. He was a very calculated coach. He did his homework. Uh, He put in the work um, and, and comedy wise, like you'll be sitting on the edge of your seat. So uh, I'm excited to unleash uh, Sean Hawley to the rest of North America and, and, and the world that haven't had the chance to hear him sing and dance. And on the episode, uh, I think the highlight for me was when he, when he was auctioning a trophy to both of us. Exactly. All right, brilliant. It's time to thank our listeners and supporters of the Rugby Hive, brought to you by Wintergreen. Visit wintergreensport.com. Get some of the amazing products where you can uh, make sure if you keep yourself active or if you just injure yourself sleeping, it'll do both tricks there. Check out our Rugby Hive store at World Rugby Shop. Also visit gilbertrugbycanada.com. Let's stock our new size five Rugby Hive ball. And then endurosportofficial.com. Look for the 40% link on our socials to get that there. Thanks to our wordsmith and journalist, Karen Gasparino, known as The Gaz, as well as the legend, Ben Gollings, who'll be joining us for various content pieces. Also, thanks to the stars of the Rugby Network for showing our podcast on that website, therugbynetwork.com. Make sure you engage with us on the socials, at Rugby Hive on Twitter and Facebook, at My Rugby Hive on Instagram, and our website where everything is housed, rugbyhive.com. All right, it's time now for Season 2, Episode 28 with Sean Holly. Well, welcome, Sean. Such a pleasure having the man known as the holster on our show. There's not many people uh, call me that. Uh, we must be pretty close if you call me that, Dallin. But thanks very much for having me, uh, you and Robin. It's great what you're doing. Thank you, my man. Well, listen, how are you keeping that side? And, and are there any positives uh, that you've discovered during this time? I'm keeping well. Um, as you know, mate, I'm, a, I'm a quite a busy chap uh, these days. I do lots of different things. And I suppose like a lot of people, this, this period is... Um, given us a chance to sort of take stock and reset a little bit. And I've got a, I got three kids and a dog and a wife. And so rarely do we get a chance to spend any time together, let alone this much time. So that's the positive to come out of it is how much uh, time we've been able to spend together. It gets a bit touchy at times, um, testing the relationships, but uh, all in all, it's been really good. My, I got two teenage sons. I'm really lucky that I've I built a gym next to the house and you know we're in there every day. So that's been real good bonding for me. And uh, yeah, that's, but that's the only positive. You know, obviously I, I, I'm a freelancer in terms of my, my work and uh, that's come to a, a complete halt until further notice. And um, of course, it's, it's a dreadful situation um, with, with people losing lives and catching this horrible thing. 
Yeah, no, it really is, is, is a bizarre, crazy time, you know. But speaking about your gym, uh, I was wondering why you're in such good shape every time I see you. Now, now I know why. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about that. I'm in better shape than when you saw me in um, Argentina last. But uh, although I wasn't too bad in Japan, I was running out there. But uh, no, it's just good. You know, I, I'm 50 this year. I'm 50 in November. And that's come around seemingly quite quick. And um, not that it's a midlife crisis. I've always liked to keep in some sort of shape. And with two teenage sons who, who want to be in shape, want to learn to lift, then I can, I can teach them and, uh, and we can do it together. So it's great. Yeah, exactly. Well, they wouldn't learn anything from me in that department. But let, let's go back. Let, let's delve a bit into you, you growing up. Where did you grow up? And tell us a bit about your childhood. Okay, so I'm from a, a town called, called Portol, Portol. I nearly said Portoilet then because that's what we call it. It's Portolbert. Um, which is in southwest Wales. It's sort of between Swansea and Cardiff on the M4 corridor. It's a steelwork in town. It's um, it's it's not a very affluent area to be honest. But I'm I I was born and raised in a in a village called Cumavon, which is up the Avon Valley, and that's where my family live now. Um, it's a beautiful part of the world. Um, I grew up playing sport. Um, we have mountains. We're two and a half miles from the coast, from a lovely beach, and uh, we've got great forestry at a river. So today, I've been walking the dog about seven o'clock this morning um, for an hour, and um, I've just come back from being out on the river fly fishing, believe it or not. Uh, we, we opened up our rivers yesterday, so I'm really lucky where I am, but it, it was a great childhood, lots of friends, um, simple schooling um didn't go to any private school went to a, a very traditional state school and um you know sort of grew up that way with with lots of friends and and uh, a, a very loving set of parents uh, and a younger brother and uh, let's go back to that fly fishing did you catch anything today i didn't rob today uh yesterday in wales the fisheries opened the the rivers as long as you were on your own you could walk to a river uh, and social distance but um, it's very early in the season here I just wanted to get out and cast a fly and sort of get it going saw some fish scared a few but didn't catch any <laughs> maybe those fish are social distancing but they've been social distancing me for a long time I'm on Vancouver Island on the west coast of Canada so we we had here Yamo on a few weeks ago and he's been out prawn fishing with his dad and and I've been doing the same so yeah, the, it's it's early in the season to be to be wasting our time trying to get salmon, but uh, always love to get out there. <laughs> yeah, ours is a small river. We've got um, you know, we've got uh, brown trout, and then uh, starting now this time of year, the sea trout and the salmon start running up from the sea uh, to lay their eggs. So yeah, we, we've been short of rain here in Wales, which is really unusual for Wales. Um, but once we get a bit of a downpour, then I bet you'll see some fishermen out there trying to catch those salmon. That's awesome. Now tell me just uh, growing up in, in Wales, what sports did you grow, grow up playing from an early age? Well, in school in Wales, we, we all play rugby. Um, play rugby in the winter and cricket in the summer. Maybe a bit of athletics. Um, soccer has become huge. Uh, it always has been in the UK, but in, in Wales, Swansea City and Cardiff City, our two clubs uh, reach Premier League status. So, you know, the young people are really play a lot of football. But um, growing up in school, uh, you had rugby masters and P masters that were predominantly rugby. So take my school where I was head boy. My P master was at the time the Welsh coach, uh, the late John Bevan. He played outside half of Wales and the Lions in the 70s. So you had to play. If you had a, a soccer ball in, in the yard, he'd put a knife through it. That was it. You had to play. You couldn't kick the ball in, in games in rugby. So um, that was that. But I did play soccer too. Uh, I was with Cardiff City for a while as, uh, as a young schoolboy. I played a lot of cricket. I captained the Welsh schoolboys team at under-16s. Um, but I loved golf too. So my dad is a bit of a golfer. Uh, he taught me to play golf. So it was really those. But you know, I, I'd try my hand at anything, Robin. I, I'd play basketball in school. Uh, I loved playing tennis down the local park. I was one of those guys. I was a sport billy. And uh, if there was a ball or a bat or anything involved, I was there. Well, that's a recipe to success, and that's definitely something we try and promote with all the kids uh, out there that, that are playing rugby, but definitely multi-sport athletes is the direction to go as a, as, a, as a young man or young girl. Now, let's look at your university story. So you, you attended Loughborough. What areas of, of education did you study there, and what are some of your, your favorite memories of rugby at that time? 
I've got great rem- memories of Loughborough. I was um, I was quite fortunate because I didn't really know what I wanted to do other than play sport. And um, if you think this was sort of late eighties, um, early nineties, I I was very fortunate that my mother's first cousin is a guy called Keith Barnes. Now, he played rugby league for Australia in um, in the fifties, late fifties and early sixties. He emigrated from where I live, Port Talbot, with his parents at the age of 13, 14, went to Wollongong in Australia, ended up playing for Balmain Tigers, playing for Australia, became known as Golden Boots Barnes, and then went on to coach Australia Rugby League and then become the team manager. Now in 1990, when I was due to go to university, he came over with the Kangaroos and I went up to London with my dad to meet him, watch Great Britain against um, the Kangaroos. And he said, look, why don't you come out and live with me for a bit, play some rugby, play some cricket? So I did that. Uh, so I had a gap year, went out and played cricket for Ramwick and rugby for University of New South Wales, had a great time, worked in the Balmain Leagues Club uh, and then travelled around Australia. But in the meantime, I had applied to go to Loughborough University and then got accepted. So I came home and then went to Loughborough. It was the best thing I could have done because it, it made me, I, w- I was much more mature and ready. And then I hit the course running and it was ideal for me. It was almost like a, being in, in a professional sports entity. Loughborough is a renowned sporting university. And, uh, of course, I played rugby there. Um, got great friends still. Played um, three years at Loughborough uh, very successfully. Uh, in my middle year, I went down to play for Rugby Lions. I had a season Courage League One there, which, again, was really, really good. Um, and my only regret is that I didn't stay on for a fourth year, but I, I sort of got a job, came home, started teaching. Um, but I, I probably had had my fill and what I'd learned at Loughborough was how to play an open expansive game because in student rugby you're trying to avoid all the big guys. Um, we'd play university rugby on a Wednesday afternoon and then on Saturdays we'd play all the club sides like Bath and Leicester and Saracens and uh, Northampton which would be their second team with a sprinkling of first team. So it was a real good grounding. Um, and yeah, we won a few trophies and uh, I, I had a, a real insight into what it was like to be a, a future possible professional athlete or certainly somebody who aspired to be one. So it was, a, it was an amazing time for me. And then just your, your career uh, was cut slightly short and it wasn't because somebody came up with a knife and stuck it into the soccer ball uh, <laughs> or rugby ball. Um, but tell us how, how, how that ended for you. Well... I um, I was playing before I left uh, for Australia for a club called My Steg, uh, which was back then when it wasn't professional, you had what they termed in South Wales first class clubs. If you became a first class rugby player, then you you had something about you. And I was in, and you didn't go along to training; you were invited to go. So My Steg, um, I, as a youngster, I got invited up and and started making a bit of a name for myself. But my home club is the club of the late John Bevan, my P-master, called Abravon, the Wizards. And you've had a lot of great old Lions who played for them, Alan Martin, the second row, Max Wiltshire, Leslie, you know, all these Ray Giles, all these guys, Billy James, John Bevan himself. And um, we all, as kids, all me and my mates, wanted to play for Abravon. So when I came home from Loughborough, I developed as a player and I transferred and, play, and, and then became an Abravon player. And I was going really well in 94, Dallin. It was 94, as you know, the game started. But South Africa came over to the UK. And um, I was playing really well. I was kicking goals. I was playing at centre or full-back. And we played the South African tourists on a Wednesday night. And I always say in my after dinner, as a, uh, I had a nasty injury, but I don't remember too much about it. Actually, it was 22 minutes past seven on the 22nd of November, 1994. And... I just passed a miss two and uh, went in support. But the, the upshot of it was I collided nastily in a tackle and ruined my knee. So um, cartilage, cruciate, but more importantly, what did it was I shattered my kneecap into three. And the game not being professional, me teaching at the time, it took me about 18 months of convalescence and three operations uh, to get back to any sort of fitness. And in that time, the game had gone professional. Abraham had got promoted. And I'd missed my time, really. I, you know, I, I never really made it back. And and through that time, you know, I said to myself, look, if I wasn't going to make it as a player, I'll, I'm going to try and make it as a coach because I was coaching an under-18 team in a college I was teaching. And um, I went then straight into to coaching at the age of about 24, 25 maybe, 
and did all my, my badges really quickly, worked my way through the system, coached Wales at under 16, under 18, under 21, Wales 7s, Wales students. So, you know, got all those quite under my belt and learning my trade. Um, and the rest, as they say, is, is history. So in a way, obviously, it's very unfortunate that because you probably still wanted to play as a youngster, but it definitely propelled your, because you kept that passion for the sport, right? Tell us a bit more about what you studied, because didn't you design a course yourself or something like that I read? I mean, you were nonstop uh, in the books and, and taking that to the next level. Yes, yeah, so, so I study sports science, but um, whilst teaching A-level physical education and, and sports science at, at the Sixth Form College and coaching, um, I was, I can remember I was sat in like a staff development, a CPD session, and it was pretty boring. And I just seemed to pen something um, along the lines of what we were doing at Loughborough, you know, along the lines of, but it was essentially born out of, look, if there were, if there were kids, male or female, whatever, creed, color, size, who didn't make it to become a professional rugby player, what other avenues could they go down? And what could we do in education to, to, sort of facilitate that so I basically penned a course based around sports science but it included modules on laws and refereeing rugby coaching where you picked up qualifications and got experience coaching youngsters um, skills and developments you learned to skill uh, to train skills uh, there was um, analysis so in basic analysis notation back in those days and video uh, and all sorts of other various things and, and we were able to get rugby studies and Graham Henry came down and sort of give it a big thumbs up the educational governing body called BTEC picked it up and put it on the shelf and it went across 80 eight institutions on the first cohort was Adam Jones the tight dead prop who went on to win um, you know, 95 Wales caps and five Lions caps. He's a centurion. So the one thing I regret about that, Dallin, is, you know, we went across 80 institutions, but as young as I was, I didn't copyright or patent anything. I didn't write a textbook. So I made no money out of it. <laughs> oh, man. But, but this story is fascinating. I mean, that's the thing is, is how one's journey continues. Um, but I, when I read that about you, uh, I mean, obviously, I'm so impressed with what you've done uh, as well. But that's, uh, I mean, that's remarkable. Well, it set me up because um, the college I was in, I wanted to create an academy. So we didn't have academies in Wales then. The Scarlets was the region next to the college and I, they had a conveyor belt of talent and I wanted to, but they weren't interested. You know, um, the game wasn't really that professional. They were successful in their own right. And so I started looking elsewhere and I took the concept when I got the job at Harpery College in Gloucester. It was... Um, a, an amazing principal there, a guy called Malcolm Wharton, who had a vision. And I was able to bring new courses, write a, a h and in a degree and bring students in from all over, South Africa included, um, and then create a university team. And then Gloucester picked me up. I became the Gloucester under 21 coach. I amalgamated the two. We got Gloucester based at Harpery College. And they now are based there permanently, and it's an amazing facility. So that was, I'm really proud of that as, as much as anything I've done, really, because the legacy is there. I was the first director of rugby there, and a lot of talent has come through there since. What did you learn from that experience with the, the Gloucester under 20? That's a good question, Rob. Um, it was probably the first insight I had to real high-quality players. Um, so they give me the under 21 head coach job, but at the same time, on a Monday night, I was coaching the United team. So they have A teams, United teams in the English Premiership. And so you had big guys coming down, dropping down into that side. And as a young coach, a Welsh guy in Gloucester, which is like, you know, rugby. Um, and I wasn't a name of any sort as, as a player or a coach. So um, I had to deal with, you know, big names, people like Andy Gomesol, the England scrum half, um, Dimitri Ashvili, the France scrum half, uh, who else, Henry Paul, who had come down from, from rugby league. So these were big characters and I had to win them over, not with any sort of personality, but with my know-how and my coaching ability. So that was, and then in the under 21s, we had guys who were, who were going to go on and be real good players like James. James Simpson Daniel became a phenomenal player for Gloucester in England. And so that's what I learned was a bit of man management around that and perhaps uh, a, different, a different way of playing the game because 
Dean Ryan and Nigel Melville had taken over the first team from Philippe San Andre. So I'd learned from three different coaches, really. And I felt that that galvanized me, gave me the confidence alongside, you know, what I was doing at Harbury and then alongside, because at the same time, I was doing uh, Wales Sevens at the time, uh, traveling the world, learning that, doing my coaching level four in the WRU. So it was a pretty tough time because we just had our first son and I was traveling a lot and working ridiculous hours. But that's what you do. You do the hard yards as a coach. And, and that's why, you know, I, I, I'm quite vociferous about coaching these days that you can't just come out of professional play and expect to be the head coach of an, you know, a major league team or, or, or a pro 14 team. You've got to do some hard yards and, and learn. And, and so I did a lot of that learning at Gloucester and Harbury, yeah. Yeah, I, I've been taking, uh, well, I'm always taking coaching courses. I'm doing my master's right now in in, uh, in coaching, multi-sport essentially in Canada and, and taking other courses. And we were on a, on a call last night and, you know, it's not about X's and O's. It's literally about man management or, or uh, lady management, I guess, depends who you're working with. And, uh, you know, all those different experiences and getting your hands dirty is, is what shapes you as a coach, but ultimately gives you the tools to deal with lots of situations. And, uh, and just like as a young player, the more you play, the better you get at it. But often when we're younger, we work really, really hard. And as we get a bit older, we start to work a bit smarter. So I'd love to, I love to pick your brain down the road. So let's, let's dive into your, uh, your, your coaching experience with the Ospreys. You coached there for over nine seasons. That's a long period of time for a professional coach. What are some roles you filled over those years and, and what was your coaching philosophy at that time? I guess it evolved over nine years as well. It did, it did evolve uh, hugely. Um, it was a bit of a perfect storm in 2003 because as, as I said, I was up and coming. Scott Johnson and Steve Hansen had me on the radar because I was doing my badges. I, I must have been doing something right and they, they brought me into the Wales environment a lot um, and taught me a lot. So when re the game in Wales went regional, it went from the club game to five regions. Um, my local region was an amalgamation of the Neath and Swansea clubs, Neath, Swansea, Ospreys at the time. And I, I, my wife and I, we were sat in, in our house in Herefordshire back then uh, watching the Scrum 5 programme, which ironically I, I'm on as a commentator and pundit now, uh, and watching it on a Sunday with, with a, di a Sunday dinner in front of me and it came up right here, the proposed uh, 10 coaches of the five teams, heads and assistant. And for Nice Swansea Ospreys, it was Lynn Jones and Sean Holly. Well, I had gravy all over my lap. I was like, I, come, I had no inkling whatsoever. And the following weekend, I was on a stag weekend in Spain, one of my best mates. And I left my phone um, in the room, as you did back then, you know, in, in what was that, early 2000s. I got back late at night and I'd had something like 20 missed calls from Steve Hansen. Uh, and, and a voicemail that said, uh, mate, it's easier to get hold of Osama bin Laden than it is you, he said. Um, <laughs> ring me when you, when you get this message. So I rang him and he said, look, you've got to get down to Lynn Jones and Mike Cuddy and uh, have an interview. So the following evening, I drove down after training. Uh, I met in Neath Rugby Club. And on the way back to Gloucester, Lynn phoned me and offered me the job. So I got the job. So, but it was a bit of a perfect storm. I'm, I'm going around the hoses to get to the answer to your question, Rob. But, you know, Lynn, Lynn was a fantastic technical and tactical coach. He was, he was phenomenal. He still is. He's phenomenal. Eye for the game. Uh, taught me a lot. But I think I came with a bit more uh, system and structure. You know, I knew training plans. I knew to organize the week. Uh, I knew how to set up the training week. Um, you know, I had all those experience of sports science and coaching at academy level. I had an eye for the development of a player. So I brought different skills. I was very good at analysis. So I was able to present, um, tee up training sessions, matches. So I, I sort of complemented Lynn's sort of, uh, strengths as well. And then, Again, the experiences that I'd had along the way, all of a sudden, I was sat in front of, you know, Welsh internationals, British Lions, and then very quickly, New Zealanders, Stefan Tablanche, we signed from South Africa. Um, you know, then we had Philo Tia Tia, Jason Spice, and, and it started then to get quite cosmopolitan and, and guys with experience all around the world. So again, I had to work hard. Scott Gibbs was our first captain. You know, he was a, a, an idol, my idol. So 
I had to very quickly earn the respect and I did so by working hard and giving them time and sitting with them and helping them improve little nuances of their game. Definitely skill work, which I was big on back in the time. And then support Lynn and, and the other staff because of my sports science background. I was able to liaise with the conditioning guys and the medical guys. So I had my place and I developed. My philosophy on the game was, was like when I play my sport, I, I, it's very simply take more satisfaction of putting somebody else in space, you know, put people in space. That was, that, that was it really, um, you know, and, and I'm very much a team-based ethic. But I brought uh, a little bit something different to, to Lynn's real insight from Gloucester. We started playing this three-pod system, which you think now sides have been doing. Um, we brought what we call then a three-pod system. Um, and we devised two ways of playing. And uh, quite interestingly, looking back, we had a neath way of playing, and we called them all those plays neath, which was very direct, round the corner, or pick and go. That was our neath plays. And then we had our Swansea plays, who traditionally played a more expansive game, which was like a three pod. Um, and, you know, we got into our straps really quickly. So I evolved that over time, working with players, getting experienced players in and uh, all blacks and Grand Slam winners and Lions. But uh, that was fundamentally what kickstarted the Ospreys. And you mentioned some of those great players. I know when we were having a, a cool drink catching up in Argentina, you just the list goes on and on. Uh, for our listeners out there, can you talk about some of the players you really enjoyed working with? Um, and uh, and then, then are there any players that came to you as pretty young, fresh players and you really helped develop their game that you're proud of? Yeah, well, I apologize to the listeners if, they, if they're not familiar with some of the names, but I'll go through some of the big names. That, like, so take Alan Wynne-Jones now. He's, he's a world-leading player, uh, leader. Um, a big name. So Alan came as a youngster to the Ospreys. You know, he was a young second row. Uh, I remember his first training session. He, you know, Lynn was teaching him to jump. You know, he couldn't really jump properly in the line out. So we got a couple of props to lift him. Um, it, it's, it's a nice story, actually. His his nickname with all the players is Gwyntogs. Now, we call rugby boots in Wales togs. Okay? That's the slang for it. We're togs. And Alan Wynn turned up to that first session with white rugby boots on, right? White togs. Now, white in the Welsh language is Gwyn. So his nickname is Gwyn Togs. He's Alan Gwyn Togs. So all the players will call him that. Um, but he was he's brilliant to work with. You know, had, had all the nine seasons I was there, Alan was there. Uh, fantastic. Other Welsh players like Ryan Jones, who became the most cap captain, you know, a real warrior on the field. My My... Big mate now, because I've gone and done a lot of work with him, is Shane Williams. Best player I ever worked with. Can't say I coached him because you can't coach Shane Williams. You just let him let him go. he would beat you in a phone box. Um, and many others. I mentioned Adam Jones. You know, uh, There are so many of those players. Justin Tiprick, more recently, who's become fantastic for Wales and the Lions. Uh, you know, in, his, in his own class, really. And then one of the young, other younger players coming through, uh, when you think around the time you had people like Mike Phillips, James Hook, Gavin Henson, who I played with his dad at my stake, one of the players who left a lasting impression was Dan Bigger, who again has made a real name for himself. And, I, and a quick story on Dan. We knew him coming through as a 15-year-old. And I, I remember we had a game on a Friday night at the Liberty Stadium in Swansea. And uh, he's quite a brash guy, a confident guy, Daniel. You see it on the field. But there was a knock on the coach's door. Hours before the game, you know, uh, we're getting ready. I'm having a cup of coffee. Uh, the managing director, Lynn Jones, and myself. There's a knock on the door, and there's a 16-year-old boy on his own at the door. And uh, he came in, he said, Mr. Holly, Mr. Cuddy, Mr. Jones, you may have heard this week that uh, I've been approached by two colleges in London. One's with the Saracens Club, one's with the Harlequins Club. I just wanted to come and tell you face-to-face -face that I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to be the next Ospreys out at half. I'm going to play for Wales. Thank you very much. A 16-year-old Daniel Bigger. <laughs> no way. It was, yeah. Um, and he's gone on to do great things. So they, they are some of the Welsh guys. I'm doing a disservice to a lot. But then we had some great overseas guys. You think, you know, Spice and, and Philo Tia Tia were, were really good for us. They were like the Viv Richards and Joel Garner in cricket terms uh, who came to us on springboarders. Then Marty Holler was a, a sensation of a signing. He taught Justin Tipperick pretty much everything. Justin Marshall coming over and adding that winning mentality. Stefan Tablanche, uh, the sheer professionalism that he showed. 
And then we, we signed Tommy Bow, who, again, that was another perfect storm, you know, went on to great things with the Ospreys and then Ireland, the Lions. And, of course, then on the flip side, we had somebody like Jerry Collins, God rest his soul, who came along and added a, dare I say, a bit of an edge to us, you know. Um, do you want a quick story about Jerry? Definitely, please, please. I, 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 I'm not going to swear it'll be as it is, but, you know, Jerry was renowned as a hard man. He was around as a big drinker as well, okay? Um, so you, everyone knows me in this area. So I get, like, phone calls on a Sunday. He'd have a map of our area on his, on his flat wall, and he'd pinprick on a, on a Sunday. And where it was, he'd just go. He'd go to that club. Um, so I'd have phone calls on a Sunday, things like, you know, uh, Sean, all right, it's uh, Glynneath Rugby Club here. Just letting you know, Jerry's here, having a couple of pints, playing the bandit. All right, he's all right, he's all right. Then a couple of hours later, I have another one then. Sean, come grach, Rugby Club here. Just letting you know, Jerry's here. He's having a couple of pints of cider. He's playing bingo with the members. He's all right, he's fine. <laughs> and then my brother come up then. He said, yeah, I just saw Jerry in, in the shop in, uh, in town. I said, really? Yeah, he's walking out with a, a 40-inch colour TV. I'm thinking, where's he going now? And then the last phone call of the night then, Sean oh, Abraham Quinn's here, just letting you know, Jerry's here, he's putting up our new TV for us, he's having a great... <laughs> he'd, go, he'd go everywhere. But I remember one, he was a big drinker, and I remember one morning, early at the training base, we'd had a lovely blanket of snow here in Wales, and I thought I was usually first in, and all the fields were white, crisp, and it was a beautiful blue sky, and I was about to go in, and I noticed there's a lone figure out in the middle of the fields, long black coat, black hat, newspaper under the arm. And he was doing this. He was, he's like, excuse me. He was like, he was just walking really slow like this, you know, walking round in lines and circles. And I'm thinking, oh my God, it's Jerry. He, he's had a big night the night before, you know, and he's, well, he's there for ages, just plodding along, plodding along. And I went to go into the office and I thought, oh, I'll see him after. No, I better check. And I turned round and I realised in the snow on the field, he'd drawn a big cock and balls. <laughs> so the players would see it when they came in. How do you deal with that? No, that is brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. But I also love it. it's such a small place too that you have these phone calls from people you know saying, he's fine, we got Jerry. And, and imagine those people's stories as well. To this day, they're able to share yeah. those brilliant, brilliant memories, you know. Um, let's talk about brilliant memories as well. You were part of a team that won five major titles with the Ospreys. Um, is there one that's more special than the others for any reason? Great question. Um, everyone is special. Uh, you guys would know, you know, it, yes, we play for, with mates and memories, and, but those memories, most of those memories are around winning. Uh, and I love winning. Um, so I, I think the first one was really special uh, because it was against all odds. We were probably reflecting back the one true region that was made it was two clubs coming together and we embraced that and it was only in our second season the 2004-05 season and it was a thrilling win um, and it was no coincidence that Wales went on to win their first Grand Slam in 27 years with a lot of those boys in it that was really special um, I think as well on a side note Dallin um, in 2010, it was my first title as a as a head co as the Ospreys head coach, so it meant something. And that year as well, we'd we'd cruelly got knocked out in the quarterfinal of the Heineken Cup um, to a, a last minute referee decision, which haunts us all now. Uh, and really, that was the probably the year that we could have won the Holy Grail. But we went on in all of that disappointment. We went on to win it in Leinster's backyard in Dublin against the O'Driscolls and the Darcys and the Sextons. So that was pretty special too. But um, I never get tired of winning anything, even if I beat my boys in, um, in table tennis. Now, looking back, uh, you had a lot of great years. What made your side so successful and made you different than, than your competition? For another great question, I think the I think the the long tenure of some of the players and the coaches, which you don't get these days, Rob. Do you? You know, you're not. It's getting a lot like other sports where you know you don't do something one year, your pressure's on. You know, supporters have their say, stake, massive stakeholders have their say, public pressure. So I think the longevity of the core of people, uh, coaching team, players. We had a lot of 
a lot of the core players were from the area and we prided ourselves on that. So a lot of the guys I mentioned, particularly forwards, were from the area. They grew up in the area, they aspired to be Ospreys and they came through the system. And that, that counted for a lot. Um, that, that was a big factor. And the learning, you mentioned it earlier, Rob, the learning at the time, Munster were a big team, winning European Cups, Leicester winning Heineken Cups, and we, we drew them a lot in the, in the Heineken Cup. We learned from those and we, we chipped away. So, you know, you, you couldn't in the early days just go to Munster and expect to win. You know, they had half the island team and it was a tough place to go. So we chipped away, got closer and closer, get a losing bonus point one year and then get the confidence, build the squad, you know, around which takes a while, around those core guys, sign real excellent overseas players, not just two-bit guys, quality who will bring to your culture and add to your team and chipped away, chipped away to eventually then you get and you beat Munster once out there at Toman Park and oh, the penny drops. And then all of a sudden you grow and then you start going to go in there and expecting to win. So, you know, that, that, that growth, that time, that longevity, the learning, the core of the squad and the, and the manufacture of the squad and the profile of it all contributed to the, to the sex, to success. Of course, there were huge lows, but then, you know, that's life, isn't it? it um, every time there's a, there's a bit of a dip, then there's a peak coming very soon. So we, we were quite philosophical about that. A winning, building a winning uh, culture doesn't happen overnight, and that's pretty special that you had a number of those legends uh, work with you and, and, and have that trust with them over that time. And then as you gain these new players, it's easier for them, I, I'm sure, for, for them to buy into the culture and that, that style of play. Yeah, and it did help that we had this sort of siege mentality. You know, um, we, we were, you know, if you come from our area, Neath Swansea, Portal, but Bridgend in around here, there's not there's not a lot to aspire, you know, to the big city in Wales is Cardiff, and then next to that is London. So, you know, there's not a lot of industry business around, and you know, these a lot of these Valley boys, you know, they do good and they're tough, um, and that you know we that galvanised us, you know, really did. We 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 had we created a bit of a fortress at home and a, a mentality, a way to be tough to beat. So, you know, they're ingredients that are present in sport, all sports today, and certainly rugby, aren't they? Um, we created a nice, nice little thing because we didn't have an identity as the new team, as Ospreys. We researched the osprey bird, and what we found was when it mates. It mates for life, mates for life, mates for life, like me and Dallin. So it was a play on mates for life. When you're knocking heads day in, day out, and you go into Munsters and Leinsters and Elster and Edinburgh, tough, tough environments, you become mates for life. So it became MFL, and we designed a belt buckle, a solid silver belt buckle. Uh, it had all of the brands on it and the, the year we started, MFL. And what it really meant was... You know, we're made for life. And that belt buckle was for the players, player of the day. And it was the players in the change room at the end, win, lose, or draw, blood, sweat, and tears. They selected the 24th man would go around, who's your man of the match, who's your man? Of... And the players, player of the day would be presented with a belt buckle. Um, and he wore it straight. He put it on his belt straight away. And they all wanted one. You can imagine. I remember my 250th game as, co as coach. Um, they did the routine. Uh, went in the changing room and when they went to announce it, they announced me. And I've got it here, actually. Um, do you want to see it? We want to see it. Well, this, will be our, this will be our second belt buckle on the, on the rugby hive. Uh, who, who's at the first? Uh, Canadian uh, Olympian. So she, uh, her hometown, there's a rodeo there and there's, they have a rugby, uh, rugby event competition. If you win it, you get a belt buckle. So there let's see go. it. Well, this is, this was, well, you know, I cried my eyes out when they gave it to me, you know, because it wasn't meant to come to me. And that just sort of meant so much. And of course, uh, there you go. It's solid silver. And um, there it is. So it's got the Osprey bird. It's got the, um, the Osprey mask, which becomes the brand thing. The Inception, which is 2003. Um, and MFL, which is Mates for Life. So very special to me, that one. Very heavy. Um, and uh, very proud to have it. So very lucky to have it as well. There's not many of these ever made. Do you still wear it from time to time? Sorry? You still, do you ever wear it from time to time? 
I don't. It's got pride of place in my cabinet here, and um, one of my sons is going to be very lucky. He's going to he's going to have it. That's that's beautiful. Well, let's dig into the good stuff. So, do you have a couple class touring stories to share with us today? Oh, class touring stories, clean ones. Um, Medium. Well, I I always refer back to a tour story. I go back to that 2010 um, season because we'd lost in San Sebastian to Beirut in the Heineken Cup, and it was such a massive downer. I mentioned Philo Tiatia. He was inspirational for the Ospreys. He he brought a lot to the culture. You know, anybody who knows out there, Philo Tiatia, he was the daddy of rugby, you know, uh, best mate to Tanu Manga, but everybody, all the players were looked up to him, you know. Um, and, and But things like, you know, he'd be first out in the training field, he'd be last off and he'd be picking up the line out straps, you know, that the Welsh boys had thrown from practice. He'd be taking the dishes back from, from lunch. You know, he'd be sitting down with the young players going through their game. If you played in Italy on a Saturday night and you won, you know, most of the Welsh guys would be off for a night out. Philo would be in the changing room sweeping up and packing the kit with a kit man carrying it to the bus. Those sort of things. And then 2010 was disappointing for the Heineken Cup because it was his last season. He was retiring. So I remember saying to Ryan Jones, our captain, we cannot let this great man finish like this. We've still got a Magnus League to win. But we had to go to Ireland for three games in a week because one game had been called off a of bad weather in the season. And we negotiated with the Ospreys to say, look, don't fly us back and forth. Send us over. Give us a bus. We'll have an old school tour. We had to play Munster on a Friday night, right? 20,000 in Toma Park. They're all playing O'Connell, O'Callan, O'Gara. All the bloody O's in Ireland were playing, I think, right? But we had to go there. And we won, right? We'd beaten them. I'm in the change room after going, boys, it's a famous win. It's a great night. We've got to celebrate the win. You're allowed a couple of beers. That's all in the hotel, right? We'll have a couple of beers. We've got to go on and play Ulster. Lovely. Did that. On we go to Ulster on the Tuesday night. 16,000 people at Ravenhill. Not only did we beat Ulster, Tommy Bow scored against his old club in the last minute for the bonus point. We had to we had to win two and get two bonus points. We've got the second win now. I'm I'm going nuts. I said, boys, this is a famous win. We've got to celebrate this one, right? Everybody in the hotel uh, reception, hotel bar, drinks are on me. Wish I'd never said it. They trashed the place. I had to send six of them home the following morning. <laughs> <laughs> so so no. that, that that's that one we we stumbled on to Leinster got a losing bonus point got the semi-final beat Glasgow and then won the final but yeah one lesson don't tell your players after a big win drinks are on me you've got to celebrate in the hotel they trashed the place so that's that one and then um I suppose another one is, is, is slightly off the field. It's a different one. When, when we'd finish, Shane Williams and I, we've, we've got this sort of connection and we do some work for the Lions and the travel company on the Lions. In 2013, I'd organized all sorts of dinners and speaking engagements. We were going with the travel company to Australia for the Lions tour. And we were, we were going to earn a lot of money and have a great time and go to all the games. But I had all these lunches and dinners, speaking uh, occasions. And I'm all excited. I, I've justified my trip to my wife because we're going to make a lot of money. And uh, I get Shane's playing in Japan. So I get to Hong Kong. I'm going to meet him in Hong Kong and then fly on to Australia. So I'm so chuffed now. I get to Hong Kong. Here's Shane. He comes over and he says, um, I got some bad news. I said, what's the matter? He said, Rob Howley rang me yesterday and asked me, would I play for the Lions? <laughs> I said, you can't, mate. We've got all these dinners booked up. We can't. <laughs> You're going to cost me a fortune. <laughs> so he got right enough. The kit man was there when we got off in Sydney. Oh, he got off in Sydney. I had to go up to Queensland. I'm waving him goodbye. He's playing against the Brumbies on the Tuesday night. I'm on my own in Brisbane thinking all these dinners I'm going to have to cancel. I'm watching it on TV. And for all those 200-odd games that I called Shane Williams, it's the only time I've sat watching the game, praying the bugger was going to get injured. <laughs> <laughs> and he pulled his hamstring out to the top. Thank you very much. Yes. Didn't have to cancel a thing. <laughs> oh, that's ridiculous. Ridiculous. But I can see you guys shared a close bond. And that's, oh, that, that's absolutely brilliant. 
So you and I met in uh, Argentina last year at the World Rugby Under-20 Championship as commentators. And I will say right from the start, you impressed. You were in a local band at the bar called Jekyll, Jekyll and Hyde, right next to our hotel. So is everybody a professional singer in Wales? Yeah, they'd like to think so. Um, but yeah, I, I look, growing up, uh, you when you play club sport in Wales, particularly me, cricket and, and rugby, um, you'd have a good old sing song after with the opposition. You know, we've got hymns and arias in Wales. We've got choirs and uh, it's a bit of a club tradition to sing songs. So my parents as well are big singers. Excuse me. My mother's in a choir. She's a party animal. She plays the piano. So back home when I was a youngster, there's all be sing songs. And, you know, we've instilled in our cricket club. I'm the president of my local cricket club. I've been playing there since I was 12. And all the youngsters coming through into the first team now, they, they have a tour and it's a sing song. It's compulsory. And you don't get that a lot anymore, you know, with, with youngsters growing up. They've got too many other distractions. So it, it's a good bond. It, 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 and we do like a sing song. If you've ever been to the, the old Cardiff Arms Park or the Millennium Stadium or now the Principality, you'll understand that we like a bit of a sing song. And I love the one you had uh, about the Ospreys. That's where I learned about your uh, your Ospreys background. It was a, a classic. We'll have to record and get this on the episode next time. Yeah, I do it for my after dinners. It's, it's called Nine Long Years uh, to a very familiar tune. Um, and most people tend to join in because uh, everybody hates the Ospreys because they, cause they won so much. <laughs> well, our, our club... Uh, is uh, is on Vancouver Island, my home club, the Couch and Rugby Club, and they still to this day. It's we have a sing song around the piano, and Steve McCulloch, legendary uh, um, rugby player on the West Coast. But uh, you know, you look back at Gareth Reese. So Gareth Reese's career when he retired, it was career highlights, and one of his highlights was was singing around the piano with with Steve McCulloch, and uh, still to this day on a Thursday night, all the boys will be around the piano, and and the guys that can't sing like me. I get pushed to the back of the bus with a cold beer. So I, I'm totally fine with that. But uh, yeah, it's a special culture that, uh, and it, it just helps, it just helps, uh, you know, obviously make a team gel and, uh, and just build that culture. Let's transition to your broadcasting career. What do you enjoy about that opportunity? Well, I gotta be honest with you. I absolutely love it. When I left the Ospreys in 2012, I, I just got, a phone call from the BBC, Scrum 5 is our um, traditional program and uh, on BBC Wales. And they said, would, would I come on and, and just be a bit of a well, pundit, I suppose, uh, for a game? And I've always been able to communicate. You know, I, I've always had that ability to, to talk a lot, but uh, to get messages across. And because I was so engrossed in the game, I knew the ins and outs of the game. So... It it, came, it must have come across quite well because they asked me back. And then, you know, I've been there ever since. And uh, I sort of got a little bit of a niche as the man in the truck. So uh, at the games, we've all seen the trucks where the production is. So I would sit in the truck and analyze the game. I do a little piece before, uh, just a piece of camera like this, just highlighting in the space of a couple of minutes what to expect in this game. Watch out for him. Watch out for this. This is what they're going to try and do set the game up, watch the first half in the uh, in the truck and quickly with the technicians turn around some quick analysis with basic sort of arrows and circles and lines and whatever to to enhance the half time production, Dallin. You know you know what I'm talking about. Um and then the same for full time. And then they that 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 went re down really well. So they started giving me a piece on the Sunday show doing the same, like the summary of the games analysis wise. And then they, they branched me into a bit of pitch side and then eventually some commentating. Um, and so, again, probably a little bit my, like my career and my coaching. I'm a bit of a jack of all trades now. You know, I can turn my hand and I'm happy to do it. I'm a willing horse. You know, I, I put a lot of hard yards in, as I've always learned to do. And, um, and you get your rewards from it. I absolutely love it. You know, and the diversity of it is fantastic. I get to go and meet Dallin and, and the guys and, and work with them on the under 20s, which is a fantastic thing. And then the Guinness Pro 14, I work for Premier Sports TV. And then it comes to internationals. I get to work on um, on BBC television for the Wales games, which is huge. You've got a huge audience in Wales for that. And then the Heineken Cup stuff, I get to work for BT Sports. So being freelance, 
for that is great. And that profile then gives you opportunity for people to see you to do other things. So I, I host events, I speak motivational or lightheartedly at after dinners and, and that's another revenue stream. And then again, I, I do a lot of writing. So I write for Guinness Pro 14 and I write for Rugby World Magazine in a column called The Analyst. So it does offer different things, but I absolutely love it. I put my heart and soul into it. And what I always tell everybody, I, my mates, much like your guys, they played sport with me. They're, they're plus or minus five years of me. They tell you straight. So whenever I'm doing anything, like I'm doing this now, I can't BS. I can't be somebody I'm not. Uh, I, I'm talking to them. Because if, I'm, if I don't, they'll bloody tell me. <laughs> Well, I will say, you know, the, the, for me, the Welsh accent and the Scottish accent, I think they're just so wonderful and, and we know, and you have the insight to go with that as a coach and, and player as well, which is, which is lovely. So we, we know that you auction things off, you, an event host, an MC, all the good stuff. Can you give us a mock auction? Because that's always one of the things we, we'd like to hear. Just pretend you're auctioning something off. Can you do, can give us a little snippet? Okay. Right up. Let's give this a go. Is it? Well, lot one, here we got this fantastic silver trophy, a beautiful trophy. It's a one-time winner, uh, the Davy Travel Trophy. Everybody wants this down at the Grove Golf Club. Uh, released last year, so it's a one-of-a-kind, no replica of this. And there's only one winner, 2019. The winner was Sean Holly, the fantastic 13 handicapper. Now, we have a reserve on this. What's the reserve? £500, £500 reserve. Any bids on £500? No, it doesn't. I'll drop it to 450 then. 450 to you, Dan, and 450 to you. Rob, I see 500. 500 to you, Rob. 550, Dan. Oh. The man with a nice haircut, Dallin there. I'm sure I've seen him on TV. He's on 550. Robin's back in at six. There he is, the former Canadian Sevens electric player. There he is, sporting a very nice haircut himself. Ships in the background. He's got enough money to own his own ship. He's up at 650 now. Dallin's at 650. Any advance on 650? Going once at 650. Going twice. Are we all done? Fair warning. Sold. Dallin Stamford, the Davy Travel Cup. That is unbelievable. On the spot. Sean Holly, that, that's what makes you such a genius. <laughs> I don't know about that. I don't know where to get it from. <laughs> Next time we'll get you to say it in Wales. All right. Um, there are an array of other talents that you're involved in, and uh, but but charity work is is one of them in, in your ambassador roles. Can you can you dive into that and give us a bit background on them? Yeah, um, I try to do as much as I can, and um, you know, as you boys will know, there's lots of charities out there. They're all worthwhile, and so you know. Over the last couple of years, I've, I've zeroed in a little bit, uh, had people suffer like we all have from cancer. And um, especially a couple of years ago, my eldest son, we had a nasty scare. He had a, a nasty tumor on his, on his neck, a couple of millimeters from his spinal cord. It sort of slapped us in the face a little bit. That's why I, it's, it's one of the major reasons I haven't gone back to coaching. Um, Give me a little bit of a moment. So um, the Valindra Cancer Center is something that's, close to close to my heart I, I've, I've sort of attached myself to that a lot of us in rugby and wheels do Sam Morbin Jonathan Davis is the president Shane Williams Martin Williams and we do lots of things treks cycles events dinners uh, to raise as much as we can I, I rode 10 marathons in 10 days uh, last week just to, to try and raise some money and a lot of rugby boys contributed to that as well Shane did 770 miles in a week so yeah, it's just something I've t attached to and just try, try to make a difference, really. Um, if any other requests come in, I try to do them. If it takes too much time or conflicts, then I have to say I'm sorry, they understand. But there's, you know, things like you do pieces to camera or, um, you know, you're able to sign something or get somebody to, to do something or a quick appearance. I'm, I'm happy to do them as long as time allows. But, you know, it, it, I find it easier by, by labeling one attributing to one Valindra Cancer Center. And, and the other thing with that is you get worthwhile experiences out of them. So you raise all the money, you work hard. For example, my elder son, James, and I, we trek Machu to Machu Picchu on the Inca Trail in Peru, um, which is amazing because, you know, he had this thing. He was able to meet cancer sufferers and people who'd recovered from it and, you know, guys who, who were supporting it. So you get enriching experiences from as well. So, you know, and there's lots of people doing good things out there. I just try to do my bit, Robin, to be honest. 
Yeah, that's lovely, man. You've you've uh, you've got such wonderful connections, and you put them to such good use. I saw those photos of that Machu Picchu trip. I mean, what what a as you said, what what a stunning memory to share that as well. And we're going to put all the uh, links to all the great work you do in our show notes, obviously as well. You know. Um, but Thanks. speaking of of show notes, uh, let's give your podcast a plug. I had a great uh, time to be on with you uh, and Kyle, and give give our listeners a bit of a plug there for the Tuesday Club. Yeah, it's just an idea. Kyle Reese is a mate of mine. He's a Welsh actor. He was with, he was in a Welsh BAFTA award-winning film called Pride. Uh, he's now in the big American series Outlander with Sam Hu and a Katrina Balf. Um, and he's been nagging me. He's a massive rugby fan, and he was nagging me. And I said, "Look, Kyle, I contribute to podcasts about rugby. I write rugby. My life is rugby. I wouldn't mind doing something just a little bit different off the field." And if we get rugby guests on, then we talk about other things, you know, um, and we called it the Tuesday Club uh, because it was easier for us to release it on a Tuesday because of my work. And it's gone down really well. And, you know, really appreciate you coming on, Dallin. Um, we've had rugby guys. We've got Justin Marshall coming on next week, for example. Uh, we've had Shane and, and all sorts. And, and, but we've had big actors and directors. So we had Matthew Reese, the Welsh actor, who's just been in a big film with um, Tom Hanks, Sam Hewen, the lead, who's in um, a Vin Diesel film just now. It's just light-hearted, and we talk about films and box sets. And, and it's just, you know, this for no monetary gain at all. It's just a bit of fun to get us out there. And, uh, you know, we're really enjoying it. I, I've become a little bit of an entrepreneur, Dallin, to be honest, since I finished coaching. It's why I haven't gone back. But I've had great offers, but, you know, I'm enjoying it too much. I've got a, a lovely business down West Wales called Muck Adventures, where we do outdoor adventure holidays for for all sorts, schools, families. We do kayaking and surfing and um, kayak fishing, coast steering. You know, we've got great events all around the Pembrokeshire coast, which is beautiful. And once lockdown finishes, I'll be launching with a couple of mates, Great Days Golf, a golf business, you know, um, which is aimed at the Roman golfer. Uh, I've also got another interest where I wrote a broadcasting skills course for schools, teaching them presenting and interviewing and all that sort of stuff, which is called iBroadcast to develop their self-esteem. That's that's fantastic. We create eBooks and mini programs and documentaries with the kids as the stars and the producers and the filmers and the interviewers. So my life is very rewarding like that. Um, lots of different things rather than maybe the 20 years of day-to-day -day tracksuit on parking at people that, are, that I did in the past. Well, you definitely keep it fresh. And uh, does that mean if things open up, uh, we'll do that little trip to South Africa for the Lions tour? You said we could... Uh... Could jump on, yeah? Absolutely, mate. Absolutely. Let's just hope this virus goes away and uh, lockdown opens up and the Lions Tour goes ahead because World Rugby needs it, doesn't it? <clears throat> we need a Lions Tour. We've got the World Champions. Perfect timing. Um, you know, it'll be a strong Lions team and well coached with Warren Gatlin sort of sharpening his tools down in New Zealand. And uh, obviously a fantastic Springbok team that will be chomping at the bit. So it, it, it would be a fitting end to this new sense of a virus if we could if we could have that too. And of course, you and I, Quagga, we'd share a few um, Castle Lagers, Lion Lagers and any other good South African exactly. beer brand. And you can take me to a braai. Well, take you to Bry. I will. We'll open up more uh, red wine bottles on the wall if we need be. You know, those sort of things will come out. Have you seen that, Robin? Have you seen him do that? Not oh, this, it, this nutcase. Now, if you haven't got a... Don't take a bottle opener to a red wine drink in your hotel room because Dallin gets his training shoe off, puts the bottle in the training shoe and bangs it against the wall. I thought he lost his marbles, but right enough, the cork comes out and he pops it and then pours the red wine. Unbelievable. Oh, good. I, I, I have tried that before, but it didn't work out so good for me. No, you need, you need, you, it's all it's all in the trainers and in your mindset you know so uh it was it was first done with uh, with frank bunce at, at at his wedding and stuff so uh, yeah it, it's it's likely continued now holster final final question final story um you're obviously an entertainer um you're like ricky gervais you know you go up and you tell stories and, and they're brilliant is there anything you can end with um at one of your events do you have an opening story or something about shane williams give us one more before we go uh... Does it have to involve Shane Williams? No, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. But I know you, you talk about him every, every third word. I'll tell you a quick one. Um, so when I, I got asked to coach Romania, right? I had to go and coach Romania. I didn't have to. Uh, they asked me to go and coach 
for ten, two 10 day stints with Lynn Howell as the former Welsh coach. Yes, I'd love to. It involves two 10 day trips away. And then, so at the time, I'd finished at the Ospreys and me and the wife, and we were experiencing with the kids a lot of this sort of bed swapping nonsense. You know, it's like when daddy's away, you know, daddy's away, the little one jumps in with mommy. Mommy is like a drip for work the next day because she hasn't had any sleep. The little one's like a lemon because she hasn't had any sleep. The middle one gets up in the middle of the night. Oh, what's going on here? He's messing around. So he's he's tired for school the next day. The eldest gets up. Oh, what's, what's all the noise about? So he's like a lemon going to college the next day. So I thought, I'm not having this. If I'm going to remain here for 10 days, I'm not having this bed swapping nonsense. So before I went, I sat the three of them down on the end of the bed. I said, right, James, Ryan, Shauna, good start. I remember their names. I said, right, when daddy's away now, we'll have none of this bed swapping nonsense, right? None of this. I said, you all need to sleep. I said, Shauna, you're the little one. I know you're missing daddy, but mommy needs to sleep. You need to sleep. You sleep in your own bed. I'll buy you a present when you come home. Brian, you little bugger, said, you stay in your own bed. You've got exams coming up now, right? You stay there as well. James, you're the daddy of the house now while well, well, daddy's away. You're the man about the house, so I want you to be responsible. Sleep in your own bed. And off I went now for 10 days to Romania thinking, done my job. Imagine how horrified I was on my return through a packed Cardiff Wales airport. My nine-year-old daughter runs through shouting at the top of her voice saying, Daddy, Daddy, good news. Nobody slept with Mommy while you were away. <laughs> <laughs> that is unplayable. <laughs> uh, there we are. Out of the mouths of babes. Oh, that is brilliant. I mean, that's the thing. You have so many stories that can be rugby, it can be family. Uh, that's why we love you so much. Listen, Val, it has been absolutely marvelous to catch up with you. Here's some insight into the Ospreys as well, your background. Uh, it's such a pleasure to have you on, Shawnee. Thanks so much for having me, Dal and Robin. It's been an absolute pleasure. Good luck with it. Um, and uh, I hope all your listeners enjoy, um, enjoy this one and, and all the other ones you do. It's great to see you both. Take care, you little warrior. Speak soon. All the Cheers, best. Pal. Also never stops talking, does Peronara, but I suppose that's the job of a scrum off. Set! He feeds. Five out from the own line. Satutu picks up, finds Jordan. Jordan skins one. Back to Hoskins Satutu. Here comes Peronara. Back on the inside. Barrett! Oh, not even Wes Craven could have directed that. It's frightening from the All Blacks. And Bowden Barrett gets a popular try in DC. Thank you for listening, you sleek sensations. If you haven't already, please subscribe to Rugby Hive Podcast and catch us on all the socials at Rugby Hive. We appreciate your support. Be safe out there and we'll see you soon.